every day you and I get bombarded with negative news. Just like the body becomes what we eat, the mind becomes what we're putting in. It is important to listen to stories that not only gives you hope, but also inspires you and uplifts you. In this podcast, we're interviewing experts who will break down the solutions to the world's most pressing problems. And I promise you, if you listen to this podcast, you will not only stay informed, but you will also feel more energy in your life. Welcome to Great.com Talks with... Today we're going to talk about mountains. Why is mountains important? And to do that, we have invited uh, David Malden, who is the director of ISIMOD. And ISIMOD uh, stands for the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development. So, David, a warm welcome to this interview and podcast. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Spirit, and glad we can talk about mountains. Uh, give me a, uh, an understanding about um, why, why are we talking about mountains? Why are mountains important? Okay, good. Good. So I'm sitting actually in Kathmandu. We have, have a wonderful rain shower outside. I hope you can hear a little of that. But uh, so our organization works uh, for mountains and people. Actually, uh, give an example of the place where we work called the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. Uh, this stretches uh, from clear from Afghanistan to Myanmar, so quite some, a huge area. Uh, and includes the Tibetan Plateau as well as the Himalayan range. So we call this area the pulse of the planet. So it's like taking your heartbeat. And if that pulse is healthy, then we also know we're healthy. We as humanity is healthy. But if that pulse is weak, uh, we know we also have problems. And I would say right now the pulse is weak. But let me tell you why that is so important. And, and I'm using this Hindu Kush Himalayan mountains just as an example for mountain ranges all over the world. But the, the first is they're uh, an incredible, well, they're incredibly gorgeous place. It's wonderful to be here and work here from that perspective. But I also very much appreciate the culture, the diversity of cultures in the mountains. Here we have a thousand different living languages. Uh, it's huge with biodiversity. There are four global hotspots for biodiversity in the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. Uh, and it's an important resource base for energy, uh, ecosystem services, as well as water. Now, if we just consider water, for example, from these mountains, there are 10 huge river basins coming off the mountains. I'll name a few, Indus, Ganges, Brahmaputra, Mekong, Yellow Yangtze River. Uh, and there are 240 million people in mountains. That's not a small number, but in those river basins, there are like 2 billion people, depending on the water resources coming uh, from mountains. And by the way, this uh, mountain range is uh, shared by eight countries. I mentioned a few. Uh, Nepal, Bhutan, India, China, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Myanmar, and Bangladesh. And uh, so it's incredibly important for those eight countries, but through water and energy and uh, biodiversity for Asia, and I believe very much for the world uh, too. Um, it's also a place that's under threat. Uh, for many reasons, right? There's environmental degradation, threatening ecosystem services. Uh, it's a sustainable development goal hotspot, an SDG hotspot. So 30 people, percent of people are in poverty, about 50% are malnourished, about 80% do not have access to clean energy for cooking, right? But then on top of that is climate change. Right. So if it wasn't hard enough already, we have climate change uh, severely impacting uh, the region. So if I can just go into the climate change impacts in mountains for a little bit. Um, the first is that uh, temperatures rise faster at higher elevation. So it gets hotter faster as you go up and up in the Himalaya. So if, for example, 
we could reach a 1.5 degree world like we're targeting at Paris, it would be two degrees in mountains. And uh, if we continue our rate, our trends with emissions of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, we'll reach upwards of five degrees in mountains. Now think about glaciers. So if we're in the Hindu Kush Himalaya region, even if we could get to 1.5 degree world, we would lose one third of our glaciers. At present emission trends, we will lose two thirds of our glaciers, right? And think of the impact of that. But it's not just a story about glaciers in climate change. It's also a story of shifting monsoon and rainfall patterns, of, of warming temperatures affecting ecosystems and agricultural systems. It's more and more disasters, floods, uh, landslides, avalanches in the region. So it really is a significant uh, issue uh, moving forward. Now the role of my organization ISIMO is a few things. One is it's to get people together, get uh, people who work in science together to tell us what's happening in the region. But then secondly, it's to work with communities uh, it's to work with governments in the regions to develop solutions. And I, that's the important part, is that we can really take action uh, in the region to develop solutions. So thank you for, let me give you a short summary of what I've taken with me so far. It's a, it's a huge mountain area, uh, the Himalaya, that you are kind of surveilling and getting research from, that DCMOS is providing information and data for decision-making. Um, and then from this um, kind of mountain area, there will be people dependent on the, the rivers, people who are um, dependent on, I guess, uh, the biosphere, the, all the biological ecosystem. Uh, and you're saying that it, it goes faster, climate change goes faster on in the higher you come, so in the mountains where it's quite high altitude, you you would have almost double the degree, not three degrees, but five degrees. Um, in, and that would affect um, the weathers, the, the glaciers, which then would get spin-off spin -off effects. So it's really connected to, uh, the mountains would really be connected to the whole um, earth system in a sense. That's right. The pulse of the planet. Yeah, I think you can see that now. <laughs> I see that now. Yeah, the pulse of the planet. Yes. Yeah. You were about to go into um, the solutions. Is that it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, so the, the, we can't just sit and know something is happening. We have to develop solutions, right? And so that's where I feel happy with our role uh, with ISIMOD as an organization. And it's actually solutions at different, uh, different levels at the community level, working with mountain people, but also with governments and also with the global community. And I can give a few examples of that. So the first is we are seeing more disasters and let's say high mountain communities are under threat uh, from floods or say where the glacier breaks, right? And a lot of times they get flooded or a lot of times they're what we call cloudburst storms that. Uh, hit uh, communities hard and fast and causes flooding. So a, a solution we've developed with our partners, but also with communities, our community-based flood early warning systems, that basically it's a simple practical technology that you put upstream, it senses the flood, and then gives a warning, a siren or a mobile phone message uh, to people to move to get it get into safety and that's actually worked uh, in several different communities uh, secondly a lot of people uh, are dependent on farming and but what we'd like to do is diversify options diversify livelihood options so one is with farming right the mountains are great for nutritious food that city people would love to get uh, organic agriculture that's healthy uh, is to try and get these high values. Uh, David, the, yes. the audio disappeared there. Could you just uh, repeat the, the last few sentences that you said? Yeah. So what 
the mountains are a wonderful place for high valued mountain and nutritious mountain products, right? That people like me would love to get, right? So, so the idea is uh, switching to, or, and oftentimes switching back to traditional crops uh, like sorghum or forest products or switching to organic or new products that can grow in the mountains and getting them to market with the benefits, economic benefits going to mountain communities. Also to diversify it, mountains are a wonderful place for tourism, right? But sometimes tourism goes wrong. Too much plastic, for example, or, or uh, too many people bringing their own eating habits and benefits going back to cities and not staying into mountains. But actually, I think with this COVID-19 pandemic that hit, has hit the mountains hard, perhaps this is a good time to press a reset button and get back to sustainable tourism. And another area with communities is with uh, small businesses, say around uh, sustainable energy, solar, wind power, right, uh, biogas. Uh, can we set up businesses that can uh, provide energy to communities so they can get that clean cooking, uh, for example. So lots of opportunities, but what it needs is investment. It needs attention. It needs government policies to make that happen. So also our role is to work with governments with their policies and their investments. Our role is also to try and stimulate business uh, and investments in the mountains. And also a big solution too uh, is to communicate the message of mountain people to the global community. I mean, mountain people can do that best, but sometimes it's also the science and research through say IPCC that can also make a difference. So I think it's incredibly important uh, and also happy to be here to get this message to a broader global community. Now, I'm going to mention one last thing is uh, about solutions. Uh, it's incredibly important that we are all cooperating, that people are getting together about mountains, right? And so that's uh, working between countries and uh, about solutions. So we, we have our eight countries uh, that I mentioned, sharing experiences with these countries. So for example, we had yak herding communities talk to each other across borders, right? We've had farming communities talk to each other and share experiences. But we also find that we have scientists and governments in this highly contentious region who are totally willing to work together about mountains as well. So this regional cooperation uh, is incredibly important uh, in the region. And that's a role of ISIMO as well. Uh, thank you for the, um, the summer of the solution that ISIMO is, is kind of providing right now. Um, if we just play with the thought that ISIMO would not exist. So as an ending of this interview, we're going to start to go towards down here. Uh, what would happen is if ESMOD would not exist, how would that affect the world and the people who are dependent on the protection and the, the service that you provide? Yeah, I think that, um, so our, one of our very special roles is working across boundaries, right? Between countries, uh, between communities. So it's one of the few places that people from these countries can get together. We're talking about uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, China as examples. So if we didn't have ISIMO, there's very, very few places, meeting places uh, for, for scientists to get together. There's very few meeting places for local communities to share ideas or even government officials. So we would miss that uh, uh, space for cooperation between countries. And when we miss that, right, we're missing a lot of different solutions, right? Sharing information from country A to B. We're missing the opportunity for scientists to come together and to inform the IPCC report about what's happening uh, with the mountains. Uh, and uh, so, so I believe we'd be, it would be a lost opportunity for people to develop solutions that they can do working together. Mm. If you would direct people towards uh, learn more about this, um, some kind of call to action, what, what do you want people to 
kind of do after listening to this interview? Yeah, thank you. And I mean, if you want to learn more about uh, mountains in our region, Hindu Kush Himalaya, uh, there's a wonderful assessment report. There's a summary that's easily accessible uh, on our website, the HKH Hindu Kush Himalaya assessment. That's one thing is to get familiar with mountains. And I will say many mountain ranges throughout the world face similar issues. Uh, so the second uh, thing is just on a call to action. And the first is we really have to slow climate change, right? We have to limit the global warming to 1.5 degrees because it's a huge impact on mountain people who really did almost nothing to cause it. So one is look at ourselves and the actions that we take day to day, look at our governments to make sure that we are supporting climate action. But in addition to that, it goes beyond that. I feel we all have a responsibility to mountain people, right? That we are seeing that good investments are made in mountains so that mountain people can adapt and build resilience in face of incredible changes, right? They're already, mountain people are hugely resilient, but indeed the limits of that adaptation adaptive capacity and resilience is being reached. So we do need to reach out and get help from the global community.